I was born into an intelligence family in Washington, D.C. My mother was a cryptanalyst for the Army Security Agency during the Second World War. My dad was an Air Force aviator, a B-17 decorated veteran of World War II, later became a radar intercept officer during the Korean War. He went to work for Martin Marietta, and I discovered that my, my calling was to become a cop, a Los Angeles Police Department officer. Uh, which I did after graduating from UCLA. I had interned while I was an undergraduate at UCLA. I was assigned to uh, patrol in South Central Los Angeles, uh, the highest per capita crime rate in the city in the 70s. I became engaged to a career contract agent for the CIA, and it was then that the CIA tried to enlist me to become involved in, in protecting drug smuggling operations, bringing drugs into the country, and I refused. I blew the whistle. Uh, uh, I was shot at, threatened, uh, I was discredited, uh, went through a very intense period. My fiancé left me, and the, and the chief of police uh, at the time, Daryl Gates in Los Angeles, refused to back me up. So I resigned from LAPD uh, at the very end of 1978. And I spent about 18 years uh, doing other things, and I slowly evolved in, into becoming a freelance writer. As a, I, I was a gifted writer in the police department, and that's why I was so valued in, in uh, detectives, because I could write the case summaries and investigative reports. Uh, but I evolved as a matter of self-preservation uh, and trying to find out what had happened in my life, because I didn't know all the pieces then into doing research and reading news stories and analyzing news stories and writing to members of Congress, meeting members of Congress. Uh, and what was really a futile 18-year quest to expose the fact that the CIA was involved in the drug trade. In 1996, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Gary Webb, from the San Jose Mercury News, uncovered documents and was given documents that directly linked the CIA in the Iran-Contra era, which was just after my time, uh, to the smuggling of huge amounts of cocaine in the United States, which helped pre precipitate a cocaine epidemic in Los Angeles and which spread around the country, the Crips and the Bloods and all that bloodshed that arose. Uh, and those documents absolutely confirmed everything that I had been saying, and there was a national furor over that. Congresswoman Maxine Waters and major political figures jumped on that bandwagon. And, I, of course, I had predated Gary's work, and I became involved, and there was a town hall meeting at Locke High School uh, in South Central Los Angeles. And uh, Congresswoman Juanita Millender McDonald chaired that hearing. And uh, I was called on, and the CIA Director John Deutsch was there with a big panel, including uh, Congressman Julian Dixon, who later died very suddenly of mysterious circumstances, and uh, Congresswoman Jane Harmon, who is uh, not one of my favorite people. But I confronted the CIA director, and I said, I am a former LAPD narcotics detective. I work South Central, and I can tell you the agency's been bringing drugs into this country for a long time. I was interviewed in, in depth by the House Intelligence Committee, the Senate Intelligence Committee. I was told I would be allowed to testify. I never was. I was asked to submit written testimony. But over a period of time, because uh, uh, I had, the record was very clear, <clears throat> and I had an unblemished record as a police officer. I wasn't fired. Uh, I started getting asking to do pub being asked to do public appearances and some lectures, and then it was clear to me that that there was a need for some accurate news about what was going on. And in uh, March of 1998, uh, I started a newsletter called "From the Wilderness." I uh, mailed out 68 copies to names that I had collected along the way, and I, it was an eight-page newsletter. And I said, "If you like it, send me 25 months uh, bucks, and I'll do it again next month." Uh, that grew uh, over the course of our eight years, eight year history to having uh, 20,000 subscribers, including 60 members of Congress, professors at universities around the world, major business figures, and we broke a number of major stories. Uh, the uh, we, we uh, our publication was used in many congressional hearings. Our investigation was uh, uh, and our reporting was respected on Capitol Hill. Dana Perino was returning my calls from the White House press office. My calls were returned from every department of government, CIA, FBI, because they knew I was a good journalist and, and, and the stories were useful. But the biggest story that we ever broke was uh, the Pat Tillman cover-up. In uh, 2006, I was contacted by Mary Tillman, Pat Tillman's mother, Pat Tillman being the former uh, Arizona Cardinals uh, defensive back. Uh, who joined the Army Rangers of the Army and became a Ranger right after 9/11 and was killed by friendly fire in Afghanistan. 
And uh, that was covered up, and it was a massive cover-up. And uh, out of sheer frustration, Miss uh, Danny Tillman, that's what she goes by, contacted me. My military affairs editor, Stan Goff, is a retired master sergeant from U.S. Army Special Forces who had taught at West Point. And uh, I visited uh, Mary Tillman at her home uh, in the Bay Area and copied 2,000 pages of Army records. I took them back to my offices in Oregon and flew Stan out, and together uh, we decoded. Stan did most of the work, but we absolutely established that there was a detailed cover-up. Uh, we published a seven-part series. Stan wrote it. I published it, edited it, uh, did the, you know, the fact-checking to make sure, and ultimately that resulted in the hearings run by Congressman Henry Waxman of the House Governmental Affairs Committee, which resulted in the disciplining of nine officers, three of them uh, generals, and almost all of us believe the sudden resignation of Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld when he was the next guy to be called. The cover-up went to the White House. During the course of that series, our offices were burglarized and all seven of our computers were smashed. A massive campaign was waged to shut us down or to discredit us. Uh, I, I, I fled the country and went to Venezuela for four months because the only thing that could have prevented the story from being published was my death. Uh, and that essentially was the end of the newsletter. Uh, that was, uh, I came back from uh, Venezuela in late 2006. Uh, basically had some very severe challenges. I had lost everything. Uh, had some, I was poisoned in Venezuela. I had a lot of recovery to do physically. Uh, but uh, came, moved back to Los Angeles in 2008, back to my home, uh, and uh, was kind of trying. I had had one book published, Crossing the Rubicon, The Decline of the American Empire at the End of the Age of Oil in 2004. Sold about 100,000 copies of that book. It's in the Harvard Business School Library. It's about that thick. And in that book and also in my newsletter, I had predicted the 2008 economic crash in stark detail, linking it to subprime mor mortgages, fraudulent uh, uh, bundled package of mortgage-backed securities. I named the, 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 the banks and the investment houses that were involved and many other factors that led to the, the financial collapse. So, and I'd made over the years a great many predictions, not only about uh, economic corruption, uh, I had done exposés on Citigroup and AIG long before they became household names for, for their corruption. Uh, but I all, had also become, in late 2001, very aware of a thing called peak oil, which is the, probably now the universally accepted fact. It's been out in the mainstream media pretty much completely in, in 2010. But I saw clearly that there was a connection between uh, the events following 9-11, the U.S. occupation of Iraq, to seize its oil supplies, the second largest known reserves on the planet. Peak oil and the fact that the U.S. government was clearly aware for a long time that we were going to be facing a situation like we're facing now, both economically and from an energy standpoint. Uh, there's a 96 percent correlation between greenhouse gas emission and GDP growth. Ipso facto, if you want to have GDP growth after a collapse, you must burn oil to do it. There, there is nothing that will replace the edifice built by fossil fuels anywhere. So I was uh, <clears throat> kind of trying to figure out what to do with my life in uh, 2008, early, the early part of 2008, but I was very much aware that, uh, that the economic collapse was imminent and that peak oil was imminent. And I've made a great many friends over the years in Congress. Uh, on, the, on the right, my, I have the greatest respect and admiration for Congressman Ron Paul, who appeared in my video, Truth and Lies of 9-11, filmed in 2001. Uh, and on the left, Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney of Georgia. And Cynthia was the Green Party nominee for president in 2008. The first thing I thought was, we need a platform on energy. We need a real one, a solid one. And that evolved into a presidential energy policy, which was the first title of the book now known as Confronting Collapse. By the time we're into September and October of 2008, we are well into the economic collapse, which began when oil prices peaked at $147 a barrel. Uh, I don't think anybody disputes that that was the trigger for the first uh, stage of the collapse of human industrial civilization. And it was very clear to me then that we had passed, if you will, a watershed moment in, in human history then. 
that there was no coming back and that no amount of bailouts or cooked books or printed money was going to reverse the inevitable collapse of human industrial civilization and a die-off of what might be ultimately proved to be three, four, maybe five billion people. Because there are 10 calories of hydrocarbon energy in every calorie of food consumed in the industrialized world and the chart of human population growth has added, shows that five billion people exist today only since oil was first used. We use oil for fertilizers, pesticides, we use uh, natural gas, and, and, and oil is involved in flying uh, uh, grapes from Chile and, and, and moving food around the world in ridiculously unproductive ways. And uh, commercial agriculture is totally dependent upon fossil fuels. In February of 2009, I was approached by director Chris Smith of Blue Mark Films, and that's how the movie came to be, and Chris did an absolutely brilliant job. The peak oil movement really originates from the work of former exploration geologist and physicist Marion King Hubbard, who was uh, a giant in the oil industry, who did some math calculations about 19, circa 1949, and he said, very clearly that we're going to reach a peak of production and we're going to start running out of oil. All oil production, whether it's in uh, one well or one field or a nation or the planet, always follows a bell curve up and down. And once you have reached peak, no matter how much technology or wishful thinking or money or anything else you throw at the problem, you will never be able to produce more oil than you did at peak. Now it's pretty clear Professor Ken DeFays of Princeton had, had calculated and, and predicted a peak in late 2005, and he was absolutely right. You usually only find out looking in the rearview mirror. But Marion King Hubbard in 1949-1950 was saying, maybe a little bit later, that U.S. oil production would peak in 1970. And he was, in more ways than one, metaphorically burned at the stake. Uh, for heresy, called a kook, a doomsday, but everybody shut up in 1970 when U.S. oil production did peak. And his numbers, of course, are ironclad and they've been borne out, and he is really the father. He is the chief prophet, if you will, of the peak oil movement. A great many people have followed him. I, I was taught by the greats now, Colin Campbell, Shel Aliklet, uh, Matthew Simmons, uh, people who have been at this, Ken DeFays, Professor Al Bartlett, who have been at this for a long time, and, uh, and, and, and I, with my newsletter, I jumped right into it because there was a perfect correlation, or if you will, an obvious mesh of interest between uh, peak oil and the U.S. government's con conduct immediately after 9-11 when the first priority of the Bush administration was to invade and occupy Iraq, which had nothing to do with 9-11. Uh, I, of course, was on it before the attacks of 9-11, and uh, one of the most infamous crimes that I think in, in, in U.S. history was the National Energy Policy Development Group run by Vice Pres President Cheney. I was screaming about it at the time, which used the many millions of dollars of taxpayers' money and then classified and refused to share with the taxpayers what their money had paid for. And these were many months of secret meetings with oil executives. We have been able to divine since that time that clearly what NEPDG was doing was finding out who had the oil, where it was, uh, what they had to do to get it. It's very clear that uh, even long before the Bush administration, uh, the U.S. government was aware of the, of the imminence of peak oil. Well, let me backtrack. There's two very important historical events that occurred. In 1974, King Hubbard was called to testify before Congress, several days of testimony, and it was blistering testimony, not yelling and ranting, it was terrifying uh, as to what the ramifications of peak oil would be. That's very significant because Jimmy Carter was elected in 1976 and he was the first president to really warn us about energy shortages and we all saw what happened to him. People talk about the suppression of peak oil as something done by the oil companies. No, uh, the oil companies aren't in charge. What is, the, the oil companies are a part of an infinite growth economic paradigm based upon fiat currency, fractional reserve banking, compound interest, debt-based growth, which is by definition an unsustainable pyramid scheme, which demands something that is not possible in this universe, infinite growth. 
It's not possible. I published on my website, from the wilderness site, it's still there as an archival site, from the wilderness.com, declassified CIA documents from 1974 showing that the CIA was very aware of peak oil. Uh, and those records are still out there. Uh, so the, the issue is not the oil companies making profits. The issue is, is that there cannot be economic growth without energy. And this is the, probably the key point that I make in the movie Collapse and in the book Confronting Collapse, which originally had a subtitle of The Siamese Twins of Energy and Money. You can't separate them without killing both. Uh, because there is, there is no combination of energies anywhere, I repeat, that will replace what oil does or has done. Now, we have picked all the low-hanging fruit, obviously. We're, we are now having a 70,000-barrel-a-day leak from the Deepwater Horizon well, which was a bridge too far, the ultimate reach off the tree limb to get that piece of fruit, and we've fallen off, and we don't have the technology. Man's greed for energy and consumption and infinite growth has led us to this point. I'll refer to two very important, one, one book and one study. The book was by Professor David Goodstein, Vice Chancellor of Caltech. He said something that's very clear to people in the energy industry. It takes 30 years to change an energy infrastructure and trillions of dollars of investment. Uh, another study was completed in 2005 by Robert Hirsch of Science Applications International Corporation, a major government contractor, uh, a think tank, among other things, a, 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 very sophisticated company, and, and, and Hirsch concluded the same thing. He laid out analyses saying, what happens if we recognize peak oil and we start taking action 20 years before we get there, 10 years before we get there, and, and if we don't do anything until it arrives? <clears throat> and the upshot of it was, it was, uh, we're mildly screwed, we're screwed, and we're totally screwed. And we are totally screwed because no action was taken to prepare for it in advance of peak oil. Because Wall Street demands infinite growth and any acknowledgement of peak oil would have devastated share values on Wall Street. It would have brought an end to the consumer economy. And it would have threatened, and unfortunately in the United States today, almost all major media is owned by corporations which trade their shares on Wall Street, period. So here we are now at collapse. It is here now, being accelerated by this absolute catastrophe in the Gulf of Mexico. And we are looking at a die-off of many billions of people, the collapse of, which is proceeding apace even as we speak. It's been proceeding since 2008 through Eastern Europe. It's, it's now devastating Greece, which is not just an issue of energy, because money is useless without energy. One can't eat money. Money only is a symbol representing the ability to do work, which energy really is. So you can print all the money you want to. You can't eat it, nor can you put it in your gas tank. So we are now at a point where human civilization, human industrial civilization, supporting 7 billion people, is toast. Universally throughout the movement, I was hardly the first to think of this, and it's actually kind of obvious if you think about it, relocalization is the only way to survive the collapse of human industrial civilization. Uh, here now at this particular moment in an idyllic place in Vermont with, you know, wonderful place, it, it doesn't look so difficult. But when you look at cities like New York, Las Vegas, Phoenix with, you know, little or no fresh water, Los Angeles where I'm from, clearly there are going to be major problems with this location. Uh, not only unemployment, foreclosures, it, we all know what that looks like, but it's going to get worse as hunger really starts to set in and as we discover that the government can no longer bail anybody out. A great writer, Dmitry Orlov, he's Russian and he survived the collapse of the Soviet Union. He and many others describe the stages of collapse. First is the financial collapse. Well, that's already well underway. Then comes commercial collapse. That's interruption with the flow of goods and services. That's underway right now. Uh, it's much further underway just anecdotally in Britain where goods that they've had on the shelves in British supermarkets, and Britain is a basket case right now, are no longer available. Uh, then comes political collapse, and we are on the cusp of political collapse right now. Uh, just recently the IMF 
issued a detailed report saying that another round of bailouts would trigger massive civil unrest worldwide. Well, Greece is in a state of full-scale revolution. A lot is not being covered in, in, in other countries, but just this morning I, I opened a daily digest of news stories that is research for me. I taught these people how to do it, showing that the Irish people yesterday stormed the Irish Parliament and almost took down the gates of the Irish Parliament House. This is what's going to be happening here in the United States. As, uh, as first the federal government and state and local governments go bankrupt and are for forced to cur curtail what most of us assume were God-given rights that come from someplace, the social contract is broken. The social contract will be raped is what will happen. Uh, we will see in 2010 of a mathematical certainty uh, tens of millions of people lose all of their unemployment benefits being exhausted and state governments and the federal government being unable to replenish that. All over the United States, it's not being widely broadcast, but for example, the state of uh, uh, Minnesota has introduced, introduced legislation to cut its state police force in half. Major police departments around the country are cutting back. Fire departments are being cut back. Street lights are being turned out. This is what collapse look like, looks like. Uh, school districts cutting back to four days a week, and it's very unpublicized, but the, the, the hardest hit states, Ohio, Michigan, California, are quietly releasing convicted felons from prison because they can't afford to feed them anymore. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that with massive unemployment, no unemployment benefits, people being released and police departments come being cut back, there, that's a recipe for civil disorder on a high scale. It's inevitable. It will be here in this country this year before 2010 is out. So these are very challenging times, but as a result of all these cutbacks that are happening all around us now, we see a recipe for civil unrest, and now we see the potential for displaced populations looking for places to go. There are people who want to go back to the bar who don't believe it, who call us doomers. There are people who are deer in the headlights, who are panicked, who cannot process a thought. But thank God there are many, many hundreds of thousands and millions of people, I would say, in the United States alone who get it, who are actively building lifeboats now. And a lifeboat is, is something sustainable that's local first and foremost, where your food is grown close to where you live. That's the foremost issue right now. You have to accept that not everybody's going to make it off the Titanic. It's easier for people who have been in combat, the military or police department, to accept the reality of casualties on a battlefield. They're inevitable. But the deal is to make lifeboats to save as many people as possible. And from my perspective, as an author, philosopher, lecturer, we are also in a battle to determine what will survive of mankind's history that will be carried over after the collapse, where we will have a very painful transition phase and era that will be bloody, messy, but eventually the dust will settle. The question is what will survive? The choice being presented to mankind now is either evolve or perish, grow up or die. Change the way you view the world and your relationship to it because I believe this planet is alive and I believe that we have to establish a basic fundamental connection with all life on this planet to achieve something called balance or steady state, whatever you want to call it, sustainable. Uh, that doesn't pretend or aspire to overturn the physical laws of the universe or to make man a god, but to make man hopefully an intelligent creation living in harmony in God's universe.